Thank you. Our summer series has been about uh, some great things found in the scriptures. We've looked at uh, great salvation. We've looked at great boldness. We've looked at a lot of greats. We're, we're on great rewards today. And uh, next week we'll be wrapping up this series as we're going to look at great fear that overwhelmed the church in the early days and how we should have a great fear of God today too. As we're looking at the great words, I want to begin that God created you to bless you. They just sang about the Beatitudes, bless, 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 bless. But God created you to bless you. And so I find this in the, in the first chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We go down on the sixth day, he created mankind. And we're on that day where it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God created mankind to bless mankind. Some people live their lives like God is out to get me. Do you ever feel like that? That's guilt. Guilt has overwhelmed your soul. Some churches preach to make you so guilty that they put you into conformity of what they want you to be, and out of that guilt you live in fear. God did not create us to be guilty. He created us to bless us. Isn't that amazing? Sin is what brought that guilt feeling. In the third chapter, it says uh, it, that uh, they, they sinned because in chapter 2 it told us that God placed a tree in the Garden of Eden and said, the day you eat thereof you shall surely die. And in chapter 3, when they took of that fruit, they died spiritually. And spiritually they were not blessed, they were cursed. In the third chapter you'll find that there's curse that's given to the, the man, the woman, and the serpent, they're cursed. Creation is cursed. I even know that from Romans chapter 8. It's all been cursed. God didn't create us to curse us. Our disobedience brought the curse upon us. And so when I look in the New Testament, I find this. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. God does not want us to go around feeling cursed. He doesn't want us to go around feeling guilty. God still wants to bless us. God still desires to bless you. Turn to the person next to you and say, God wants to bless you today. <clears throat> now look at him again and say, God wants to bless me today. All right, now you're getting an idea. God wants to bless us. I know that here from the book of uh, Matthew in chapter 5. Jesus said so in the Beatitudes. They just sung the Beatitudes for us. Wasn't that lovely? That was great. They sung the Beatitudes. Nine times in ten verses, the word blessed is, it occurs. God really wants... Jesus, when he's performing this Sermon on the Mount, he kicks it off by saying, God wants to bless you. Isn't that great? That's where he starts. That's where he starts. Blessings have two parts as Jesus lays these out. The first part deals with the characteristic of the person being blessed. The person that's being blessed has a certain characteristic about them that God blesses. The second aspect has to do with the reward of blessing that's given to the person who has that characteristic. So every one of these has two parts. So let's begin. The first one is spiritual poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Often people mistakenly think this has to do with physical, financial, being poor. That God is out to bless those who are physically poor, but it's not talking about physical poorness. He is talking about spiritual poverty. What is that? Spiritual poverty is that realization that you have nothing that you can offer up to God as being righteous to make you acceptable in his sight. You are worthless. You are worthless. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The soul that sins shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. And you realize that you're destitute. As it says in Romans chapter 3, quoting from the, Psalm 9, from the Psalms, it says that they all become worthless. There's none that do good, not so much as one. Whoa. 
you get to the point in your spiritual poverty that you realize that I have nothing that I can give. All my goodness is as filthy rags before God. Whew. That just takes the wind right out of your sails. That is spiritual poverty. Jesus told the story about the man who had spiritual poverty. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, so he was a right-wing, keep every last little detail of the law kind of guy. And he goes in and he's, he's proud of himself and he says, I thank you, God, you didn't make me like And he points over to the tax collector. <laughs> sure glad you didn't make me like him. And then he says, I fast twice a week. I'm so devoted to my prayer time that twice a week I don't eat, I just pray, that's all I do. And I give the Lord, Lord, I give you a tithe. So I'm so sure thankful I'm not like that, that tax collector. You know, the tax collector was stealing money from the Jews when he's collecting taxes for his own livelihood and then giving the money to the Roman Empire because he was collecting for the Romans, the enemy of the Jews. And he was the most despised, despicable person that text says that the tax collector beat his breast. And he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. The word be merciful is an interesting word. We get the word propitiation from it. Now, there's a word you don't use every day in, in conversation, propitiation. The word propitiation it comes from the word of the top, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box in the Old Testament in the temple, before that in the tabernacle. And the lid was called the mercy seat. What is significant about the mercy seat is, once a year the high priest would go in with blood, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And the blood-covered mercy seat was a covering for what was inside the box, which was the Ten Commandments. You see, what happened is the Ten Commandments, the law curses us. The soul that breaks any of these shall die. The nation was a sinful nation. A holy God is in the midst of the sinful nation. He's got this box that is his throne. That's what uh, the different places in the Bible call it, the throne of God. God manifested his glory above that mercy seat between the cherubim that were, uh, arms were, uh, wings were arched together. He, he dwelt there in the Shekinah glory like he dwelt nowhere else in all the universe. And once a year they sprinkled the blood on it and it made an atonement. For the sins of the people. So when he beats his breast, he says, Be propitious to me, O God. Accept the other sacrifice in my place. See, he knows he's bankrupt. He knows he's bankrupt. He's spiritually in poverty. He has nothing he can offer to God. He's saying, let the blood of another cover my sin. Be propitious to me, O God. I was doing that as an eight-year-old boy and didn't even realize it. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I asked Jesus, this way I said, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. The precious blood of Jesus Christ which propitiates and takes away our sin, was applied to my life and cleansed me. But I was that moment where I knew in my spiritual poverty, I could not save myself and I needed Jesus. That's the spiritual poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in my theology, I believe the kingdom of heaven he's referring here is a millennial kingdom that's coming. And he says, theirs is. That means I have a title deed to it. And when the millennial kingdom comes, I'm going to be there with Jesus. And whether I'm alive when he, when he comes, and I'm raptured to heaven and I come back with him, I'm going to be in that kingdom with him. He says, blessed is the poor. Those who have found that poverty and the need for Jesus, they get the kingdom of heaven. Second thing Jesus said is blessed. The person <clears throat> who receives the blessing are those who are full of mourn, mournful. He said, blessed are those who mourn. There's going to be a lot of mourning going on in our nation in the next few weeks. National mourning. 
We're going to mourn over what's going on in Afghanistan. We're going to mourn those who died on 9-11 on the 20th anniversary of that event. There's going to be this mourning. I don't think that it's talking about it all here. I think it's talking about that tax collector who's beating his breast, saying, be propitious to me, a sinner. I sinned against you, almighty God, and I regret it. He's full of mournfulness over the fact that he has sinned against God. When was the last time you really went into confession? Your heart is broken. You're broken. I mean, you're broken over your sin. God, I can't believe I've done this again. You're broken. You pray and you weep and you say, God, I, I, this thing just has domination in my life. How can I let it go? When was the last time you were mourning the condition in which you were in? Isaiah in 57 says that the Lord is holy and almighty and he dwells in a high and lofty place. Think about it. God dwells in heaven, a high and lofty place. But he also says, and I dwell with those who are of a broken and contrite spirit. You are just broken, 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 and you acknowledge it. There's a mournfulness here, and that mournfulness, he says, for they will be comforted. It reminds me of the prodigal, the story of the prodigal. That uh, You know the story. He said, hey, Dad, give me my inheritance now. In modern language, that was saying, Dad, Dad, drop dead. I want my inheritance. I want it now. And, and the father gives it to him. And he goes and he squanders it all. He blows it all. And he realizes, as he is now a Jewish boy on a pig farm, living among the pigs, unclean animal, and he realizes that his father's servants have it better off than he does. And it comes to him, ah, why don't I just repent and go back and ask my father to make me a servant, a slave? I'll have it better off than eating this pig food, wallowing in the mud and the muck and eating the slop. I can go back to my father and just, if I pour out my heart and I share with him, maybe he'll have mercy on me. And take me back as a servant. And you know the story, what happened. Blessed are those who mourn. He was mourning his condition. He came to his condition, his realization of the condition. And he goes back to the father. And the father comforts his son. He comforts his son. Blessed are those who mourn over the condition they find themselves in that spiritual poverty because they will be comforted by God as the prodigal by the father was comforted. He threw a feast for the son. He put a robe on him, gave him a ring on his finger. My son that was lost is now found. My son that was dead is now alive. And so it is when we mourn our condition and we come back to the Lord, he is not there to zap us. He's there to forgive us. He's there to forgive us. He's there to forgive us. Third is meekness. The person who's going to have blessing in their life is a meek person. Blessed are the meek. Notice I said meek and not weak. Big difference. Meekness is not weakness. In fact, meekness is the idea. In the Greek, the term here that's used, the idea in this word is you respond appropriately to every circumstance. So if the circumstance calls for weeping, you weep. If the circumstance calls for joy, you rejoice. If the circumstance calls for anger, you get angry. Now, most of you don't think of Jesus cleansing the temple as being meek Jesus. Jesus was meek when he cleansed the temple because the zeal of the Lord had eaten him up, and meek Jesus took a whip, and he drove out the money changers, he drove out the animals, he threw over the tables. That was meek Jesus. Not weak Jesus, meek. It's the same meek Jesus when he realizes nobody washed their feet 
before they came to the table to eat. That's like, you know, have you washed your hands? Uh, no, I didn't wash my hands. It was a culture there. Was, have you washed your feet? You didn't go to the table with dirty feet. He took the towel about him, and he became a servant. You see, he is, William Barclay defines meekness as being the perfect gentleman or lady. You always know how to respond to the situation. <clears throat> Blessed are the meek. They don't over-respond, they don't under-respond, they don't do nothing, or, or they don't just go overboard. They always appropriately respond to the situation. He says they will inherit the earth. They will inherit the earth. This expression, I think Jesus is quoting actually from Psalm 37, one of my favorite psalms. And in Psalm 37, he tells you you need to trust the Lord. Don't fret, trust the Lord. He says, commit your way to the Lord. Roll everything on to the Lord. <laughs> I like the next one. Delight yourself in the Lord. I like that. You know what he says? Make yourself happy in the Lord. Why? Because then you will inherit the earth. You know what that is? That's meekness. You trust God, all right? You're committing everything to God, and you're delighting in God, and you're going to act appropriately to every situation. The meekness, the meek will inherit the earth. The next blessing, he says, is to the people who are craving justice. I use the word justice here. It's a synonym. In fact, the same word can be translated righteous, craving righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is right? Now, he's not talking about physical hunger here, obviously. He's talking about that you crave that which is righteous. The just shall live by faith. Or the righteous man will live by faith. He's talking about blessed are those whose faith, they have a craving for that which is righteous and right. Jesus is the righteous one. They hunger and thirst for Jesus and his will. That's what you have when you get up in the morning. And the first thing is, I've got to spend time with Jesus. I've got to get a word from my Lord. So you crack open your Bible. I just have to have a chat with my Lord. And you go to a time of prayer. Blessed are those who are hungering, and it says thirst for righteousness, as a deer pants for water. Oh, man, That's a, that comes from the Old Testament. So my soul thirsts for you, O God. It's a craving for God. And what does he say here? Those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, that's their characteristic. Those people, he says, he blesses with satisfaction. Their lives are full. They will be filled. They will be filled. Jesus himself, in the passage on, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. He wants you to have a full life. That's, that's the blessing. He, he's not out to get you. He doesn't want to zap you. He wants to bless you with the fullness of life, that you, the, the, the fullest life that you could possibly have you will have hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And the righteous live by faith. And so when I live by faith in the word of God, for man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, when I live that way, I will be the fullest that I'll possibly be. The next one is being merciful. Blessed are those who are merciful. I know I keep coming back to this story. Isn't this a good story? The Good Samaritan, I think in, of the greats, this, this story keeps popping up. You know the story. The, this Jewish boy's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. One way or the other, he's going and he, he falls among thieves and, and he's beaten and the text says he's half dead. I don't know. Any of you got a meter that, you know, somewhere it says full, half, quarter, quarter alive, quarter dead, half dead. You know, it remind me of the guy that's walking down the beach and he stumbles on the beach and he looked and there's an Aladdin lamp. So what's he do? He rubs it. Out pops the genie. And the genie says to him, he says, I'm going to give you three wishes, but there's two conditions. The two conditions are this. You can't ask for any more wishes. Second condition is this. Whatever you ask for, I'm going to, I'm going to double that blessing to the person 
that is your biggest enemy. He says, that's okay, I'll take it. He says, I want a million dollars. And boom, a million dollars on the pallet just appears right next to him. He looks down the beach and there's a the guy he can't stand. He hates this guy. And boom, boom, two pallets of a million dollars next to him. Whoa, he says, hey, listen, I want a beautiful blonde on my arm. And boom, oh, gorgeous woman is on his arm. He looks down at the other guy, boom, boom, there's two women, one on each of the arms. He is so angry, he says, okay, I want you to beat me half to death. <laughs> you didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> says he was half dead. You know, that's an idiom to say that he was really in dire straits. He is in dire, dire straits. He's about to die. And along comes the good Samaritan. The priest, the Levite, they pass right by, but he has what the Greek text says is spelunk na. It's, it's a compassion, a mercy that's down in your guts. He is moved. Were your hearts moved this last week when you saw those Afghan women handing their babies to American soldiers to get them out of Afghanistan. Come on, what, what? does that not wrench you inside? That's splunk, nah, that, that's it, that's right there. If you didn't get that, you don't got it, okay? He's moved with this merciful compassion, and the text says this, blessed are those people with this mercy, for they will be shown mercy. They will be shown mercy. My cousin, um, uh, before he died, and I shared at his funeral the story of um, how we were driving down the road, my cousin, we were talking, somehow we got on the church things, and, and he'd been on mission trips, but I, I didn't see him as an ultra-spiritual person, but he said, he said, I put everything on Titus 3.5. I looked at him like, my cousin's going to now quote some Bible on me? He said, yeah. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he has saved us. He said, I am counting on that verse because he said, I haven't done anything righteous in my life. <laughs> by his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. I couldn't believe my cousin had quoted this. And then I thought about it. He may not have known a lot of the Bible, but man, he had it right. He had it right. It's not by my righteous acts and deeds, but by his mercy he saved us. And once we are saved, listen, that's what he said, blessed are the merciful. You show that kind of mercy because that kind of mercy means God will show you all the more mercy. I can't think of being more blessed than having the mercy of God in my life. You know, mercy is withholding from us what we deserve while grace is giving us the blessings we don't deserve. So mercy and grace are like cousins or two different sides of the same coin. God is gracious and merciful to me. Mercy, he withholds what I deserve. I deserve hell, damnation for my sin. But he gives me heaven and eternal life in his grace. Blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. He goes on and says, blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart, whoa. I remember Paul saying, you know, uh, hey, of the Ten Commandments, pff, nine were easy, they were a breeze, anybody can keep those. It's that tenth one that was killing me. Covetousness. All the others are just external things. I can keep away from all that, but covetousness springs from my heart, and out of the heart, the heart of man is desperately wicked. How do you clean a sinful heart? Gospel or the, the epistle of 1 John says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. That blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. <laughs> I'm mindful of a story in the Bible where Jesus is walking by and there's a blind man and a disciple said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And she said, neither, this is for the glory of God. And then he spits on the ground and he mixes that spittle and makes mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes. Like your eye doctor is going to do that to you today, right? First of all, he didn't have a dirt floor in there. Second of all, if he spit, you're going to say, whoa, what are you doing here? 
putting that on there is like, I, I, I'm putting some dirt and filth. It's like your sin on your eyes. It's kind of symbolic representation. He says to him, now go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And he goes and he washes. And immediately when he's washed, whoa, the man can see. I have a sinful, dirty heart. And I put all that mud and that goop and that junk in my life, in my heart. And I'm the one that fills it with all that unrighteousness. And Jesus says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So when I confess my sin, he washes that. It's like going to the pool and washing it off, and all of a sudden I can see, because it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. After he washed, he's challenged by different people about how did this happen, and finally he's thrown out of the, the, the temple by, by the leaders there because they're calling him a sinner because he's saying Jesus is the one that did it. And, and, and finally Jesus seeks him out, and Jesus finds him, and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? That's a title for Jesus. It's a messianic title. Son of Man was used in Daniel chapter 7 of the Messiah who was to come. He said, do you believe in the, the Son of Man? Do you believe in Messiah? And he says, I don't know who he is. If I knew who he was, I'd believe in him. And Jesus said, the one who's talked to you and now is speaking to you, he's the Messiah. And he said, I believe. And he worshiped him right there. Pure in heart, pure in heart. They will see God. He saw God, Jesus. One day I'm going to see Jesus too. I'm going to see Jesus too. The seventh one, blessed are the peacemakers. And now when we think of the peacemakers, we're thinking, okay, we've got to make some peace in Afghanistan. I'm not even sure that's what it's talking about here. My goodness, we need peace. This world needs peace in the worst way. It's not going to really happen until Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. A thousand years of peace. He does that with an iron scepter. Or, uh, he's going to do it with a rod of iron. What, what's that mean? Strength. He does not rule from weakness. He rules from strength, and he puts down every single opposition and sin against him. He's going to rule for a thousand years. It's going to be a great time of prosperity and blessing. Blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus is the peacemaker. Listen, I don't think he's talking about, you know, patching up my family relationship and all of that, although that's all very important. But I think he's talking about making peace with God peace with God. For if when you were God's enemies, what? I was God's enemy? Yeah, when you didn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were on the wrong side. You were an enemy of God. He says, if when you were enemies, watch what it says, we were reconciled to God through his son, the death of his son, Jesus. You weren't even in on the equation there. You didn't say, hey, I, I, I want to make some peace here. God was the one imposing his peace upon you. He goes on and says, how much more, having been reconciled, made at peace, that's what the word reconciliation means, being brought to peace with God, how much more, having been reconciled to God, shall we be saved through his life? What he's saying is you're pretty eternally secure. If God has given you peace by, by reconciling you through the Son of Jesus Christ, you will be saved for all eternity. That's eternal security if I've ever seen it. Now watch this. In Romans he says that, but in 2 Corinthians he says this, and he, God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're the peacemakers. Who? He says, we therefore are ambassadors. Ambassador is a representative. I am the representative of Christ. You are the representative of Christ. Everywhere you go, you represent Jesus Christ. And what are we representing? It's as though God were making an appeal through us. God's using us to share the gospel and we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, be at peace with God. We're the peacemakers if we're Christians when we share our faith and people accept Christ as their Savior. They are now at peace with God. We're the peacemakers, the ultimate peacemakers. Believe me, if we're doing that with people with God, we're making peace everywhere else too. Everywhere else too. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. You're going to be just like Jesus. You're a son of God, just like Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wow. 
did you notice that all of these are like oxymorons? They're the opposite of what you would expect. Persecution, but not just any persecution. You can be persecuted because you're doing bad things. If you're part of the cartel and you're being persecuted by good people, it's probably for good cause. But he said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You are doing the right thing and people just don't like you. Listen to me, that happens. That happens. He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now he's used the kingdom of heaven a second time. He used it at the beginning. We call this an inclusio. He's just wrapped it up. These are all the blessed. And it's almost like Jesus said, ah, but I want to add one more on top of the list. And he repeats himself. Blessed are you when people insult you, they persecute you, and they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Before he's saying you're persecuted for doing good, now he's saying they're persecuting by making up things about you. Sounds like a politician to me. Politicians make up stuff about the, the other side. Both sides, all sides do it. All sides do it. We call it making a straw man, and then you attack that straw man. You say, this is what they believe, and then you tear them down. At this time, in Christianity, they were blaming Christians for everything. Nero set Rome on fire, and guess who he blamed? The Christians. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. He's saying, when you are falsely accused, falsely insulted, falsely persecuted, you are blessed. Holy smokes, what do you mean I'm blessed? He says, rejoice and be glad. Oh my goodness, this is too much, Jesus. You want me to rejoice? Everything's going wrong in my life. I'm falsely charged. And you say, put a smile on your face and say, hallelujah, give me more. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Here it is. Because great is your reward in heaven. He doesn't say in the kingdom of heaven at this point. He says in heaven. Now, see, I see a difference here. Not everybody does. The kingdom of heaven is a millennial reign, a thousand years, but heaven is forever and ever 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 and ever. You get the picture here? Whoa. What we do in this little dot and speck of our life lasts for the line of all eternity. What we do for Jesus is rewarded for all eternity. All eternity. And he says, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All you got to do is read the prophets. We went through Amos not too long ago. And Amos, they told him, hey, <clears throat> we don't like the way you're preaching. Get out of town. <laughs> Leave us. We, we don't want to hear what you got to say. All right? They persecute. They persecute. So let me ask you this. Do you want a reward? <clears throat> do you want a reward? I mean, an eternal reward. Do you want a reward? If you do, do you want the kingdom of heaven? Well, yeah, I want the kingdom of heaven. Well, then, you're going to have to be poor in spirit. You're going to have to be poor in spirit. You're going to have to see that there, I'm bankrupt spiritually, and I need the Spirit of God to fill me with Jesus. I need Jesus. He goes on and says, do you want divine comfort? Do you want to be comforted by God? He says, in that case, then you're going to have to mourn your sinful condition. Most of us say, oh Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Where's the mourning of that? Lord, forgive me for caving into my self-pity and my own self-interest and lying to get myself off the hook. You see, that's a little more specific. Lord, I'm a liar. I hate that I'm a liar. Lord, forgive me of my lying tongue. Help me, O oh Lord, to control my tongue. I don't know what area it is in your life. What you watch, what you do, what you listen to, where you go, who you hang out with, I don't know what it is. What you drink, what you eat, I don't know what it is. 
But when you mourn it, he knows you're really serious about it. Then you get divine comfort. You want to inherit the earth? You want to be in the kingdom? Oh, then be meek. Then be meek. You want spiritual satisfaction. You want the joy of salvation. You want to be on full spiritually and not hungering and thirsting. You want him to satisfy you. Then you're going to have to get an appetite and a hunger for righteousness. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. You want Christ's mercy in your life. Well, then you're going to have to be merciful yourself. Do you want to see God? This is huge. You want to see God. Then you're going to have to be pure in heart. You're going to have to have your sins forgiven by God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you want to really be God's child? Then you're going to have to be a peacemaker. Peacemaker. You want reward in heaven for all eternity? Well, then you're just going to have to put up with a little bit right now that's very unpleasant. You're just going to have to endure it. You're just going to have to endure it. He says, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. I come back to that, rejoice and be glad. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, Peter and some of the, the, the apostles with them were taken before the Sanhedrin, and they told them to quit preaching in the name of Jesus. And just to make the point, they had them flogged. I'll tell you what, nobody's told me I had to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, and nobody has flogged me yet. But the last two verses of the book of Acts say this. They went back and reported to the church how they thanked God that he had counted them worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. You know what they were doing? They were rejoicing and being glad that they bore the marks on their back of being lashed for Jesus. He said, you know what? Jesus counted me worthy. He counted me worthy to take it for him. When was the last time you said, wow, this thing has happened to me because God counted me worthy to handle it? That's where they're at. That's where they're at. They rejoiced and they were glad because the reward was really in heaven. And you can do that too. You can rejoice and be glad where you're at, what's going on, because great is your reward in heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, We look through these blessings to the different characteristics that we need to cultivate in our lives. Help us, O Lord, to cultivate these characteristics in our lives that we might receive the blessings of reward in the kingdom of heaven and in heaven itself for all eternity. Help us, Lord, not to sacrifice on the immediate what should be sacrificed on the altar of the eternal. Help us, O Lord, not to do that which is expedient, but that which is everlasting. Bless us, O God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.